green hued uh, surprise gains for uh, various green parties around the European Union here in France as well as in Germany uh, the Republic of Ireland uh, on the basis of the partial results that we've had so far we'll give you a bit of a recap of those results in just a couple of minutes time for the for the moment it, we are just coming up to 11 p.m. here in Paris you are watching France 24's live European election coverage with me Catherine Nicholson I'm European Affairs Editor here at France 24. Uh, we're bringing you all the latest updates on the results, the many, many results as we get them from across those 28 member states. Uh, the 751 members of the European Parliament being elected and those results are coming in uh, as we speak. Right here in France, President Macron, the man who billed the election as a clash between progressives and populists, has seen his list here in France emerge, it looks like, in a close second place to Marine Le Pen's far-right Rassemblement National and uh, as we've been saying we have been seeing a wave of more green politics uh, coming into uh, the European Parliament as well. Uh, here on France 24 we've got uh, updates for you from uh, six European capitals, our correspondents there in Madrid, Brussels, Rome, Budapest, Berlin and in London. We're getting uh, live reaction and analysis from all of those capitals, of course. And here in Paris, our reporters are at the election night headquarters of the three uh, top placing parties uh, at uh, the uh, La République en Marche, Rassemblement National and uh, Luc Schrager there for us at the Green Party headquarters. So I would like to go straight to Catherine Norris-Trent, who is reporting from Marine Le Pen's Rassemblement National headquarters there. Uh, Catherine? It really has been a winning night, of course, for Rassemblement National. But as we've been saying, perhaps not quite the big win that some uh, members of that party had been hoping for or expecting. They're trying to put a brave face on it. They're spinning this as a big victory for the Rassemblement National, as something of a comeback. And when you come to them and say, look, you're only marginally ahead of Emmanuel Macron's party, you didn't win as many votes uh, as in or as much of the proportion of the vote as in the 2014 European elections. They say, you know, it's just the media being negative about their party, that they're where the movement is at in French politics, that they did well in their campaign, they rose throughout the last weeks of the campaign, that they've got a lot of momentum with them. So they're trying to put a positive spin on this. They don't want to hear uh, any putting you know, their results into context. And they're also very buoyant at the moment because they feel, well, buoyed up by having European partners from having the likes of Matteo Salvini meeting with them and saying, look, we're going to form an important bloc in the European Parliament. We're going to change Europe from the inside. So um, they're full of optimism about what they can do. Uh, yes, perhaps some of them will admit to you after a few questions that the result is a bit tighter than they would have liked. But still, they're just so pleased to have knocked Emmanuel Macron's party into second place. Uh, that's made their main objective achieved for many of them. All right, thanks so much. Uh, Catherine Norris Trent are there for us at the Rassemblement National election night headquarters. Uh, I'd just like to uh, give you a couple of bits of breaking news that uh, came in while Catherine was speaking there. Uh, over in Italy, the far-right league, the Lega party, led by Matteo Salvini, uh, has become the largest party uh, in Italy in this European election. That's according to exit polls. We are, of course, uh, waiting for full results uh, from each of these member states. Uh, and in Greece, uh, we've seen the Prime Minister, Alexis Tsipras, uh, now... Uh, we, we see him calling snap elections after June the 2nd. That is being reported to us by the AFP news agency. We'll be getting an update on that for you. Alexis Tsipras uh, doing uh, much less well than uh, he had been hoping for in this European election. Just coming back to France, though, uh, we were speaking to Catherine Norris-Trent at the far right to Rassemblement National just a couple of minutes ago. Uh, let's uh, take you now to Haxi Myers-Belkin. She's at Emmanuel Macron's party's uh, election night headquarters, La République en Marche. Uh, Haxi, we heard there from Catherine that uh, Rassemblement National are, are spinning this result, which was very, very close, just one percentage point in it uh, by the looks of things, as a, a big victory. Uh, equally, La République en Marche perhaps spinning this as uh, not that much of a defeat. 
Absolutely. The party here tonight did not win, but nor were they entirely humiliated. I heard that time and time again from people I've been speaking to. Of course, the national rally uh, was trying to make this vote into a protest vote. Uh, Marine Le Pen repeatedly urging her supporters to turn out and vote against uh, Macron and to vote for her far-right party. Uh, they did, but not on the numbers that she was hoping. As you said a little earlier, just over one percentage difference uh, in the votes uh, won by those two parties. Um, the leader of the uh, Republic on the Move uh, list, Nathalie Loiseau, addressing uh, supporters a little earlier to say that uh, the party had created the most numerous national delegation uh, in the Liberal bloc currently being formed in the European Parliament and this, uh, that this was uh, something to celebrate. However, as you might imagine, there was a lot of disappointment in the room again uh, tonight. Uh, one person telling me they were very disappointed at how the debate uh, became a little more about style than about substance. Progressive progressives pitched uh, against nationalists rather uh, than a campaign that uh, really focused on on legislation on on policy um, he said that that was an extreme disappointment that he was concerned that Macron was so keen to ally himself so personally to the campaign uh, one man telling me that uh, the fact that the Republic on the move uh, came in second place is very likely to deal a significant blow to Macron's authority especially in the eyes of his political adversaries in France and also in Europe. All right, thanks so much, Hexi Mersbel. Can we can see that uh, things are being packed up behind you there at La République en Marche. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for all of those updates. Let's uh, take our viewers finally to our reporter, Luke Schrago, who is at the Green Party's election night base. Uh, the Greens, as we said, the surprise uh, of this evening, Luke. <laughs> Well, very much a surprise to see that breakthrough through for the Greens there and uh, a great sense of uh, joy and happiness, but also one not just of determination, but of confidence. We spoke to an awful lot of uh, young activists who were here tonight. They were saying that uh, how important the environment is for them. They've been campaigning for every day for up to a month and a half, which is what they told us. Uh, they never saw any of the other parties doing the same thing. They were determined enough to get out there. They said that uh, Yannick Jadot was what they called coherent, that he was the one that, who was putting the right ideas forward. And what they want to see is uh, a great deal of change moving forward. Uh, the, this longer campaign, it gave them the sense of confidence that they expected uh, a, a decent show from the Greens on this evening. Now, of course, they hope for, for that uh, to translate into uh, deep change at the heart of European environmental policy. Now, of course, make no mistake, it is, of course, these uh, young people that are behind this political shift. Uh, we've seen over the last two years, ever since uh, the 2017 presidential election, uh, more or less the collapse of more traditional parties. They've really uh, not been doing well in the polls at all. Uh, the socialists were almost wiped out uh, two years ago, and uh, we've seen uh, this evening the uh, Les Républicains, the, the right-wing uh, centre uh, party, not doing well at all, doing, uh, doing worse than uh, they had, in fact, expected. Now, of course, uh, the Greens have managed to pick up on this dissatisfaction. What Yannick Jadot uh, said, the, uh, the lead candidate there, we will not see the far right become uh, a uh, credible option. They're very much taking advantage of uh, this movement of uh, dissatisfaction and disillusionment that's uh, really coming through with these uh, new voters, younger voters who are really putting the environment uh, at the forefront of, uh, of thinking. They really want to, uh, this to be the major preoccupation. As I said, they've been out on these climate marches. This is what they want to see changing. Now, of course, that disillusionment feeding back into uh, support for the Greens and uh, giving them the opportunity to say that they are a credible uh, opposition force, uh, a viable opposition movement. And uh, what we can expect now is to see them putting environmental policy back at the heart of European politics. Absolutely. That is what Yannick Jadot said himself earlier on. Thank you so much. Uh, Luke Schrago reporting there from the Green Party election night, uh, where the party does look to still be continuing, uh, contrary to La République en marche. Uh, so uh, that's the picture for you uh, in France. Uh, I've got two new studio guests who've come in while our reporters were speaking. Uh, we have with us uh, director of the Jacques Delors Institute. Uh, we have Sébastien Maillard. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. And on the other side of the table, Hervé Jean-Jean, uh, who's former head of the European Commission's Directorate General for Budget uh, and vice president currently of Confrontation Europe. Uh, this is a, a pro-European body. Tell us just exactly. a little bit more about your, your, your politics. 
Well, uh, it's a think tank. Uh, we, we have another think tank here. <laughs> um, we bring around the table people with different political opinions, but with one commitment, which is uh, European integration, European construction. And we try to be constructive. Indeed. Well, at, at this point, it looks like there is going to have to be quite a lot of constructive work going on here in France, all around Europe. I, I, we've talked about the, the rise of populists and the rise of Greens. But overall, uh, the picture in the European Parliament is looking uh, quite uh, splintered. Uh, Sébastien Maillard, how do you see this playing out from here on in? Well, uh, perhaps the, the problem now facing this uh, European Parliament is that we have uh, perhaps uh, too many winners tonight. Uh, the Greens can claim they won uh, in France and uh, more generally. Of course, the EPP, the, uh, social, the Christian Democrats, remain mm -hmm. the main uh, political force, but not but only by as a whisker, much, really. not as, much mm -hmm. as, as before. Uh, the socialists did good in some of the states. Uh, and so, and the, of course, the, the liberals, uh, such as uh, Macron in France and elsewhere, so they all can claim a certain part of this victory, and uh, they will perhaps need a coalition. They will not be able to impose any of their own, uh, what we call the Spitzenkandidat, you know, the, the one. Their lead candidate. The lead candidate mm. will not be able, uh, none, none of them can impose uh, their own lead candidate, but I think uh, they will need to find some sort of coalition uh, between those four forces, mm. sort of a coalition program, uh, in order to, to be influential toward the next commission. Otherwise, uh, the risk is that the, the parliament also could marginalize itself if it cannot uh, agree with uh, those. Uh, not They are not all equal forces, but uh, more equal than in the previous uh, parliament. Indeed, because the European Parliament is, is a body uh, that, that does have powers. It can't propose laws, however. It, it amends laws that are proposed by the Commission. Uh, and as we've been hearing, uh, the next president of the European Commission, it, there's no automatic process based on who is the biggest group in the European Parliament. Uh, would you agree that the European Parliament, this splintering, could perhaps lead to it uh, having less power or less relevance? No, I don't think so. The European Parliament is European Parliament. It will work really like a parliament, not the way it works in France, where generally the parliament is doing what the government is asking for, with its majority. It's a parliament, yes, with a differentiated composition, but at the end of the day, they will have to vote the legislation. It's compulsory uh, as a consequence of the treaties. They have the same powers, they negotiate on an equal footing, with the Council of Ministers, and they've got to come together to agree on legislation. Mm. Now, if we turn to the uh, election of the next uh, president, uh, the parliament will have to play a big role, but the first uh, step will have to be taken uh, by the European Council. Uh, and uh, I mm -hmm. think that uh, Donald Tusk uh, will uh, immediately start uh, consultations with heads of state and government in order to identify uh, what they want. And then this will have to be discussed with the European Parliament. Mm. But maybe we'll come to this later. Maybe indeed. There's so much to be discussed. It does look, um, just looking at the news wires as, as we speak, it looks like uh, the Euro European People's Party is claiming a victory in terms of being able to put its lead candidate forward as the Commission president. Uh, but really, uh, the European People's Party, uh, Luke Brown was giving us the results just a minute ago. Oh, hang on. I'm just being told by my producer that uh, Viktor Orban is speaking in uh, Hungary. I don't know if we're going to be able to go to him live. Uh, his Fidesz party uh, has done uh, extremely well, getting more than 50% of the votes uh, in this European election. Oh no, we're not able to bring you Victor Orban, but we will be able to bring you some sound bites from him. Uh, but uh, this perhaps illustrating my point, the European People's Party, uh, Victor Orban and his Fidesz party are members, but there's been great conflict even within that party. Uh, Victor Orban's suspended at the moment. Surely the EPP can't really expect to be dominant. Uh, the EPP has was they had 216 seats in the outgoing uh, parliament, and now they may have I think roughly 173 mm -hmm. or rough, but uh, they will be not they won't be as dominant as before. They really cannot uh, govern just with uh, one of the other two other forces. They, mm. they need at least three or four, and this that's, well, that's why I come back to this uh, coalition of the four forces that has to agree on. on uh, they may not be able to agree. On, uh, to for the lead candidate of the EPP, uh, which is Manfred mm -hmm. Weber, 
they may not agree on his name, but they could agree on a, on a program and find someone else to, to find this majority, uh, which is necessary to, to, to have the, the, the confidence vote for the next commission. I totally agree that the, you cannot overrun the European Parliament the way a uh, legal procedure is done in the EU. You, but they may, if they don't, don't do this coalition, they may marginalize them politically, uh, not legally, of course, but, uh, but politically, if they need to, if they want to have some weight in the, among EU institutions, they need uh, to do this coalition program. All right, well, uh, just to take a zone in on one particular European country now, where we have been having some uh, early results coming into us. Uh, Luke Brown joining us back in the studio to tell us about uh, Italy. We've got some indications of where things are going in Italy. Yeah, we've got the, uh, the national broadcaster, Rai. Its exit polls have uh, come out, uh, and they are uh, indicating very strongly that uh, the Lega of Matteo Salvini is very much in uh, the lead. There's a, a 4.5 Four percent margin of error on these mm. uh, uh, polls, but they're uh, on the verge of getting between 27 and 31 uh, percent. That is considerably ahead of the Democratic Party, uh, the uh, the uh, kind of social Democrats mm -hmm. in the country, which are on between 21 and 25 percent. And the Five Star Movement uh, of uh, Luigi Di Maio, who is also in, of course, government in coalition with the Lega, uh, they are on between 18 and a half and 22 and a half uh, points. Now, there's a, a number of things that are worth uh, noting there. It's very much perhaps to have been expected. We knew that the Lega of Matteo Salvini was uh, likely to do very well. Uh, it's done better than it probably uh, expected. He had been campaigning extremely hard. He's at the spearhead, as we know, of uh, the uh, populist uh, movement I in the European Union and likely to be in the uh, what is going to be a strong uh, branch of the European uh, Parliament. Uh, and he's, of course, he's been in, uh, very much in the headlines and that has clearly uh, paid off uh, his desire to form the alliances with the other populist anti-European Eurosceptic parties, be they uh, the Rassemblement National of Marine Le Pen here in France. Uh, he was, he and uh, she uh, met recently and this very, do very much does demonstrate what what we are seeing in uh, these elections of 2019, there are very much those two uh, breakthroughs for the Green Party in some part in in, uh, in various countries, in various countries, <laughs> be they Northern or Central European, but also the populist parties. I mean, mm. that's what we've been seeing here in France. So those are the, the two parties that have done exceptionally well. The other thing that's worth interesting, uh, worth noting, and is interesting in uh, Italy is to what extent the two uh, other parties, the Democratic Party and the Five Star Party, are really um, uh, in a, a very tight dogfight for mm. second place there. And that perhaps is uh, in, in the favour of both parties. The Democratic Party were doing extremely poorly just a year ago. They appear to have uh, recovered some of their momentum, but it has to be said back in 2014, they got 40% of the vote. That's looking like it's going to be completely halved. And the Five Star uh, uh, Movement, which has been in government for the past year in coalition with the Lega, not capitalising as much as the Lega has apparently done uh, in those results. So uh, we will have to see how that develops over the evening, but clearly a very good uh, result there for Matteo Salvini. And it will be very interesting indeed to see uh, to what extent he uh, dominates the far-right Eurosceptic branch of the parliament in the coming years. All right, thanks very much, uh, Luke Brown. Uh, we'll come back to you uh, as those results firm up from Italy. As we said, there's quite a big margin of error on those uh, estimations at this point. Just want to underline that. Uh, we can take you now to uh, a country that we've uh, we've not spoken much about yet because uh, the results have only just started coming in. Uh, I'm speaking about the United Kingdom, the surprise participant somewhat in this year's European election. Our correspondent, Benedict Bavio, is live for us in London. Uh, Benedict, uh, what have you got for us? Well, these are the elections uh, that were never supposed to happen. And uh, the Prime Minister, Theresa May, said that again and again, uh, and indeed uh, announced her future resignation on Friday. So uh, is she about to break another record? Are we about to witness the worst result for the Tory party ever in EU elections? Both the Conservatives and the Labour parties are expecting a very difficult night. The Brexit party, extraordinarily, only created, founded six weeks ago, yes, six weeks ago, looks like it's going to be uh, victorious. That is certainly Nigel Farage thinks he's going to get a very big number of MEPs. And I think 
if I had to summarize it in a sentence or two, we are going to witness the further polarization uh, of opinion in this country ultimately between Remainers and Leavers. Because we're hearing that the Liberal Democrats are doing extremely well. Could they become, uh, could they be second right behind the Brexit party? The Greens, we're being told, could do quite well. And what will this mean for whoever succeeds Theresa May? So far tonight, we have got eight candidates who have put their names in the ring to replace Theresa May, as we know she's leaving well, she's stepping down as uh, Tory leader on the 7th of June. Officially, that race is only due to start on the 10th of June. Mm -hmm. And really, the polarisation there, Boris Johnson started by saying he was prepared on the 31st of October to leave without a deal. So this is a very extraordinary night and 73 MEPs will be elected, will probably sit, but for how long in Strasbourg and in Brussels? Indeed, Benedict. And uh, I think it, we ought to point out uh, elsewhere in Europe, of course, uh, manifestos were published for the various parties. Uh, there was campaigning for many, many weeks. It was all very last minute in the UK, of course. Can we say that this European election in the UK uh, was really a, a sort of a, another referendum on Brexit? We can. We think we can. Let's see the result. But I think a lot of people have treated it that way. Of course, EU elections in the United Kingdom, as in many of the other EU member states, are often a protest vote. They have consequences, but very different consequences. They don't change normally a president or, or a prime minister. But clearly, uh, if the Brexit party, as we think and as polls are predicting, exit polls as well, the Brexit party does extremely well. What are the lessons, uh, what are the consequences? Will any conservative leader or candidate to become the next Tory leader and prime minister feel that they have to very much adopt quite a lot of the position of Nigel Farage? Will it entrench and make more likely a no deal? Will the Liberal Democrats, if indeed they do very well, Will they try and have mm. more with uh, another party change in the UK? We don't know how well they'll do. And the Greens. Um, will that encourage Labour that has really been officially its policy is to have another consultation? But many people, uh, if, if Labour is mm. going to do badly, it's because many people perceive that their policy is not clear. So will that make the Labour Party more likely to be more public and more vocal about having a second referendum? One last thing. What has happened this afternoon and this evening is that the Labour Party has been saying in lots of media interviews and making it known that it will do everything it can to have a vote of confidence or no confidence in whoever becomes the next Tory leader. So we could have a new Tory leader and a new Prime Minister by the end of July, as is the objective of the Conservative Party. And that person could fall, that government mm -hmm. could fall. So a very turbulent time here in the United Kingdom, and it would seem, if polls are correct, an extremely divided country. A very uncertain picture, as you say. Thanks so much, uh, Benedict Pavio, our correspondent there in London. Uh, we will, of course, come back to Benedict uh, when we have uh, some results for you from the United Kingdom. Uh, right now, though, uh, let's bring in uh, a Conservative Party uh, member of the European Parliament currently, Sajad Karim, uh, joining us down the line from Manchester in the United Kingdom. Uh, Mr Karim, thanks for being with us. Now, uh, we have got uh, one or two results are being announced in the UK. Um, it looks like the predictions are set to come true and that Nigel Farage's Brexit party is going to come out uh, by far and away uh, the leader here. Uh, and the polls have been saying that your Conservative Party is going to come in fifth. Uh, is that the sense that you've been getting from going uh, knocking on doors during your campaign? Yeah, I think it's um, been quite clear right from the outset that the uh, electorate were looking for some sense of clarity and those parties, whether it's the Brexit party or the Liberal Democrats that provided a sense of clear direction of travel uh, are the ones who are picking up support and capitalising today. The two main parties that uh, were providing a very mixed message in many ways on the Labour side, but from the Conservative side, a very pro-Brexit message, uh, but based upon uh, a Conservative negotiated withdrawal agreement deal seem to be suffering. 
Now, uh, of course, Theresa May uh, announced that she is resigning uh, as of June the 7th. Uh, she, she made another abortive attempt to bring her withdrawal agreement back to uh, the, the UK Parliament. How much do you blame Theresa May uh, for this situation, confusion and, and very much divided country? Well, I think this is well beyond any one individual personality uh, or indeed any individual office holder. Uh, the whole Brexit scenario is just so complex and so convoluted. Uh, it has really uh, divided the United Kingdom on every basis you could imagine, whether it is the different constituent uh, nations that make up the country, whether it's on an age basis, whether it's on an educational basis, whichever way you look at it, it's a completely divided country, and it's just far too complex a situation. And uh, with uh, Nigel Farage and his Brexit party set to be by far and away uh, the winner uh, in the UK of this European election, uh, that does seem to many people, including Nigel Farage, to be giving a mandate for either a very hard Brexit or indeed a, a no-deal Brexit, leaving the European Union without any kind of a, agreement on, on how that's going to work, any transition agreement either. Uh, that does seem like it's much more of a, a likelihood today, doesn't it? Well, I think it's quite wrong to draw that conclusion because uh, his party, along with UKIP, were the only two that were putting forward leaving without uh, a deal. They certainly have not got anywhere near 50% of the vote. Everybody else that was canvassing an agreed basis upon which to exit uh, certainly uh, are in the majority. So uh, neither was the referendum result uh, a vote for uh, an exit without a deal. Neither was the general election result that, and neither can that, this be interpreted in that way. That is, however, what Nigel Farage is going to be arguing after this election, and it yeah. is what we're hearing from several of the candidates to take over as leader of your Conservative Party and, of course, as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Well, um, this is quite clearly now uh, an issue of real debate that's going to be talked up by those who want the UK to leave without uh, a deal. Uh, and of course, our national politics has uh, quite an interesting time uh, coming ahead of it. Uh, based upon who is elected, uh, our parliament will take a very different position in terms of a no deal Brexit. So even if the prime minister wanted to as an individual, uh, even if that prime minister had the support of the entirety of their cabinet, they are not going to have the support of the parliament to deliver that. At this point, though, uh, with this divided country, as we've been talking about, uh, uh, the parliament itself uh, seems to have lost the, the confidence of the country to a great degree. Um, what do you think the next step is in this? The Labour Party, of course, has been pushing for a general election, completely reshuffling the cards. Yeah, I mean, it's very difficult to work out how we move forward from here. Um, this whole Brexit situation is at some stage going to have to come back to the people and the issue is whether it comes back by way of a referendum or does it come back by way of a general election. Uh, it could well be that um, in order to avoid a referendum with gridlock in Parliament, uh, the government with a Prime Minister pushing for a no deal Brexit, that the government is actually brought down and we're forced into a general election. And in terms of your Conservative Party, uh, this looks like the party's on course for somewhat of a of humiliation if the, the polls are borne out and uh, the party gets the sort of 10% or so that's been predicted. Uh, some talking about the end of the Conservative Party as we know it. Well, it's certainly a very difficult election. Um, a lot is going to depend upon now how the leadership election plays out uh, and whether that leads to a further fractious environment uh, that the party very just is unable to deal with. I don't know. Uh, I think the next three to four weeks are going to be uh, a very revealing time in British politics. All right, Sajad Karim, uh, sitting MEP for the Conservative Party, uh, joining us there from Manchester. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Just like to stay in the UK because uh, we can go uh, live back to London and speak to uh, former British Minister for Europe, Dennis McShane uh, from the Labour Party. Uh, thank you very much for 
coming in uh, as we're starting to get some indications from the UK of which way this is going. Uh, Nigel Farage has been speaking in the last couple of minutes. He told reporters it's going to be a big win for the Brexit party. Uh, I think at this point that seems undeniable. I'm very sorry. It seems he has got exactly the same seats he wanted in 2014. He was boasting to conquer all the uh, European Parliament's election seats. He had 24 MPs in 2014. He's got 24 tonight. If that's a win, well, I hope Chelsea does better against Arsenal in Baku uh, next week. Um, Mr McShane, I'm afraid we're having some technical problems with hearing you uh, there down the line to London. Um, I think we'll, we'll just try and come back to you in a couple of minutes' time and get our, uh, our, our technical team to try and get a, a bit of a better connection. Uh, for the moment, I'd just like to come back to our, our guests here in the studio who've been listening into all of those updates from all of those different countries. Uh, just talking about uh, the impact of Brexit, because, of course, we're going to be speaking about the, Euro the UK elections uh, much more over the next couple of hours. Uh, Hervé Joinjean, um, Brexit's clearly dominating uh, the campaign in the United Kingdom. Uh, how big an issue do you believe Brexit has been in the European election more broadly? Because uh, many uh, Eurosceptics do seem to have absolutely taken heart from the UK leaving. I don't think it has been very uh, key in this election. It has been key to the extent that I think a number of citizens have realized what the EU can bring to them. And to that extent, I could say that maybe part of the increase in participation can be a consequence of Brexit. But we would need political studies to confirm that. Um, but I don't think, and if I look at what I... Uh, so in France, uh, I don't think that Brexit was really at the center of the discussions. Sebastien uh, Maillard? I agree that it wasn't, uh, didn't disturb the, the, the campaign, but it was part of the confusion. It didn't help understanding this election better because people were wondering, am I electing in France 74 or 79 uh, MEPs or how will this get away? Uh, I think it will, Brexit will have more an effect inside the parliament when, if it happens, uh, we know that uh, when the 73 MEPs uh, elected will leave the European Parliament, there will be maybe some reshuffling of the political groups because uh, the, the, the Brexit Party is an, an important, uh, mm. uh, of course, uh, well, should be if we, if we uh, listen to this uh, prediction that they, they will be in the in the political group along with. Right now, they were sitting with the Cinque Stelle of the of Italy, the five star, may, movement. Uh, the five -star yeah. movement, which may go elsewhere. So there may be some split, or uh, but that's uh, still too soon to, to of course to, to to see. But I agree that in the campaign itself, in on the continent. Uh, it didn't play a major role. I think it was part of this uh, um, uh, uh, strange uh, view that the, 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 the UK leaving the EU is a dangerous game and uh, no other party actually has really campaigned on leaving the EU as such. We saw that Marine Le Pen now uh, did not uh, uh, do its campaign on, on this. So in a way, this is already a, a side effect of the Brexit. Well, in terms of Nigel Farage, um, he's sort of made the th this threat that we've alluded to uh, quite a few times in recent weeks. Uh, he said that uh, if the UK was, uh, I think he said, forced to take part in the European election, then uh, he and his allies, his Brexit party, would do everything they could to disrupt the European Parliament. Uh, and that got cheers from the far right segments of the European Parliament. So perhaps even if, uh, if I come back to you, Jean -Jean, uh, even if Nigel Farage and the Brexit Party, it's not entirely clear which parties they're allied with at the moment, that there certainly did seem to be a lot of nationalists really taking heart uh, from Nigel Farage, uh, from his uh, what looks to be quite big win in the UK. Yes, but at the end of the day, this will not disturb the global balance inside the parliament. I mean, when you have got to elect uh, uh, the uh, president of the commission, when you've got later to adopt legislation, there will be possible majorities. And there have been in the past majorities without uh, mm. Mr. Farage group. 
In the European Parliament, uh, Mr. Farage is, amuse is an amusement, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. no more than that. We, we, we can do without them, really. <laughs> mm. Indeed. Well, as you say, there hasn't been much talk of uh, a Frexit, uh, as it's called Not at here all. in France. Uh, no. On the contrary. Uh, I mean, uh, Marine Le Pen has completely, two years ago, uh, she was campaigning to, to, to leave uh, the against EU. the euro, against mm -hmm. the, the EU, and now uh, it's not part of the program, it's not part of the program also of Mr. Salvini or, or of, um, of the AFD in, mm -hmm. uh, in Germany. So I think the, perhaps the only, if I may say so, positive effect of the Brexit on this campaign is that uh, leaving the EU was not more an option. All right, well, I'm just going to leave UK politics aside mm -hmm. for a moment and return to Rome. That, uh, we've been having more results uh, coming in from Italy. Josephine McKenna joining us there live. Uh, Josephine, it looks like Matteo Salvini's uh, predictions have come true and that his Lega party is uh, absolutely running away with this. That's right. Uh, Matteo Salvini, the head of the League Party, is exultant tonight. Uh, he's already posted a photo on Twitter saying, thank you, Italy, uh, we're now number one. Uh, he's, according to the exit polls, his share of the vote is going to be around 20, between 27 and 31 per cent. Uh, that puts him ahead of uh, a resurgent centre-left Democratic Party that looks like overtaking uh, the Five Star Movement. Uh, the Five Star Movement may get between 18 and 22 per cent of the vote. So that's quite a setback for Matteo Salvini's coalition partner. And there's no doubt that this kind of result is going to lead to further speculation that this government is in a very uh, perilous state. And uh, the question will be, will Matteo Salvini take this opportunity to try and forge a fresh coalition with right-wing parties and dump his coalition partner before the end of the year? Mm. Well, indeed, well, just looking at uh, the popularity of Matteo Salvini and the Lega party, uh, this is uh, just a reminder of you as the party that uh, came in uh, second, I believe, in the 2018 uh, general election in Italy. In fact, it was the, the junior coalition partner to the Five Star Movement. So uh, uh, how has Matteo Salvini increased his appeal to this extent in, in just a year's time? Well, if we go back even further, uh, in the 2014 European elections, the League polled only 6%. Last year, uh, at the national elections, it jumped to 17.4%. Now he's almost doubled that. This man is ferocious in his campaigning. He never stops moving. He is uh, using social media like no other politician apart from Donald Trump, I think. Uh, he makes a point of taking selfies with people that show up at his campaign events, often staying hours afterwards after he's finished speaking just to do selfies with individual supporters. Uh, so he has built a fan base from the ground up using social media in a very clever way. And of course, as we know, he's reinforced that with his very hardline anti-immigration policy and a very pro-security uh, stance, uh, increase, increasing security measures here in Italy and making it uh, more easier, for example, for people to defend themselves in their own home. So a very strong uh, stance. Mm. Everyone's very clear about what his political position is. And that, I think, is also going to raise questions about the Five Star Movement that has been very ambiguous about its policies. Uh, and that is perha perhaps why we're also seeing this resurgence from the centre-left Democratic Party. All right, Josephine McKenna reporting there for us live from Rome. Thanks so much. Uh, one of our studio guests here, Sebastian Maillard, uh, I know that you want to give your comment on uh, what's been going on in Italy. Well, of course, obviously, um, Matteo Salvini is one of the big winners tonight, but I wouldn't be so uh, positive on, uh, on, on him in the sense that he, he, if he has 27 to 31 percent, as I heard, and if he's under 30 percent, it's not as great a big victory as he hoped. Uh, remember that Mat Matteo Renzi five years ago had won with 40 percent. Uh, so, of course, it's much better than when he had done uh, five years ago, uh, Matteo Salvini. But uh, 
it may be difficult uh, for for him as to 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 because we know that in the in the service he was actually uh, expecting more. Uh, he hoped he was hoping perhaps to reach thirty seven percent. So it perhaps it's not as big a victory as he hoped. But it's true that this coalition may uh, collapse in the mm -hmm. coming fall because we, we will have to agree on a new national budget and it will be perhaps very difficult for the five star movement and uh, and the uh, and the Liga to uh, agree once again on a national budget. It was already difficult last year. It may be even harder this time. All right. Uh, well, uh, we'll come back to uh, Italy a bit later, of course. Uh, let's go back to Brussels. Uh, our correspondent, Dave Keating, is there at the European Parliament, which has been turned into a giant press centre uh, for the evening. Uh, Bruss, uh, Dave, I know that you're getting uh, results coming in from all corners of the European Union. Uh, the picture really starting to come together now, I think. Yeah, I mean, we're starting to get an idea of what the next European Parliament is going to look like. And the biggest, most important development is that the two mainstream center groupings in the Parliament, that's the Socialists and Democrats and the European People's Party, they have lost a ton of seats. Uh, EPP has lost uh, 45. Uh, according to current projections, this is going to change during the course of the night, uh, S&D 40. And this means that for the first time in the history of the European Parliament, those two groups together will not have a majority uh, in the Parliament. And that's going to make a big difference when it comes time to appoint the next European Commission president, because it means that the support of those two main groups will not be enough to get somebody confirmed. They're going to have to have another group backing them. Now, whether that's Aldi, the Liberal They've gained uh, a large number of seats, although a lot of that is because of uh, Macron moving his MEPs into their Aldi group. Uh, the Greens, also somewhat of a centrist party in the European Parliament, they could prop up a commission candidate. But I think that the, the loss of seats for these two main parties or main groups is going to make that commission president confirmation process very, very interesting indeed. All right, thanks very much, uh, Dave Keating, for that latest update from the European Parliament in Brussels. Now, we spent uh, most of the last uh, 40 minutes uh, speaking about the UK. We are starting to get uh, indications of which way uh, the vote has gone uh, in the UK. Uh, and it is looking like, as predicted, uh, Nigel Farage's Brexit party is emerging very much uh, in the lead. Uh, we are joined on the line uh, from uh, the UK by Jonathan Bullock, who is an MEP uh, with the Brexit Party, uh, formerly UKIP, uh, but changed allegiance uh, when the Brexit Party was formed. And Mr Bullock, thank you for being with us. Uh, so it, it looks like it is your party's night. Oh, I think we are having... I'm afraid we're having some technical problems. We can't quite hear uh, Jonathan Bullock, MEP uh, and candidate from the Brexit Party uh, there. We will try again in a couple of minutes' time. I uh, hope you can bear with us, Mr Bullock. Uh, for the moment, uh, well, let's get a bit more on the results from the UK uh, with uh, Luke Brown, who's uh, been frantically following those results as they start to come in. Uh, yeah, what we are seeing is what was very much expected. We're seeing the first results coming in and we're seeing them very much in favour of uh, the Brexit Party. Uh, the northeast region of the United Kingdom, which has uh, three MEPs uh, is the first to declare in the United Kingdom. Uh, the result there is two of those MEPs uh, are for the Brexit Party. One is for the Labour Party. The northeast of England is, of course, very much a Labour stronghold. Uh, Labour losing one of the seats in 2014. It was two Labour seats and one UKIP seat. So uh, those UKIP, uh, the, that UKIP of voters uh, very much have been uh, evolving into a doubling, really, of, of the score for mm. the Brexit Party. Uh, that is perhaps to be expected, given that it was a very much a lever uh, district uh, during the referendum period. Uh, what we are seeing is a number of the results are coming in. The first 13, just a bit of an anecdote I'm seeing online, the first 13 areas, not regions, but areas uh, to declare uh, out of 14 were uh, in favour of the Brexit party Perhaps it doesn't illustrate that much, but it does give you an idea to what extent uh, the Brexit party is dominating massively. Some of the uh, early exit polls do indicate that the Tory party uh, of government uh, has slumped to just 10% in those current standings, which is 
disastrous, of course. Absolutely. It's unprecedented for a party of government uh, to have such a, a low uh, vote proportion in a European election. Uh, we also have results from Spain. Yes, uh, the results are in from Spain and they're good for the uh, socialist party, the PSOE. Uh, the, they are the go party of government and they are really um, consolidating their general election win of last month with 33% of the vote uh, uh, there. That's 20 seats. That's six more MEPs than in 2014. The uh, popular, par populist, popular Party sorry, uh, is second in uh, with 20%, that's 12 seats, that's a, f a fall of four on 2014. Again, that's uh, a knock-on effect, really, of the general election a result, which had a very similar picture there. Uh, one of uh, the uh, disappointments for uh, some of the parties that had perhaps been expecting to do a lot better was Vox, the far-right party, only getting three uh, seats, and Ciudadanos, uh, the centrist party, um, uh, on seven seats, and Podemos on six seats. So. Uh, very much uh, as you were uh, in the back of the crowd, but the two big parties are uh, really uh, consolidating their uh, their hold of uh, the uh, MEPs in Spain. Well, it's a, a rare uh, victory for socialists uh, in this European election. Thanks very much, Luke Brown. Uh, just while you were speaking as well, we've seen uh, for news from Hungary. Viktor Orban, the Prime Minister, his Fidesz party, looks to be taking 13 of Hungary's 21 seats. Uh, so uh, absolutely uh, running away with this European election. Well, we're going to take a bit of a, a break uh, right now. We're going to uh, show you some reports from our European uh, teams all around the continent. We'll be back with you in around about 10, 15 minutes time uh, to keep bringing you more updates, more results from this European election. Do stay with us here on France 24.